Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. For over a decade, today's guest, the Transformpreneur, has shown businesses how to thrive by doing the right thing. He shows you how to not just go green and market green affordably and effectively, but how businesses can thrive by transforming society, turning hunger and poverty into sufficiency, war into peace, and catastrophic climate change into planetary balance. He is an international speaker and TEDx alumni, transformational business consultant, and the multi-award winning best-selling author of 10 books, most recently, Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World. Welcome to the show, Shell Horowitz. Pleasure to be with you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's an honor to have you here. It's a long time coming. Um, you're doing amazing work. I love the titles and the intention and all the stuff that you're putting out there. Um, so glad to have you on the show. Um, why don't you start a little bit about your background because you've been in the game for a long time. You're doing amazing work. Um, and then maybe you can just kind of catch the audience up to speed on how you got to you know, what you're working on now. Sure. Well, I started in two parallel worlds back in the 70s when I was a teenager. One was the world of marketing, and the other was the world of social and environmental change. So I came up into marketing as an activist. And really, like the first uh, time I ever used the newspaper as a marketing tool was to promote a peace demonstration. And interestingly enough, I did it in my high school's right wing underground newspaper. That was my first published clip when I was 15. And it went from there where I had these two parallel worlds. And then a very interesting thing happened. Um, I'm going to just show where I live. The mountain behind the barn there is a state park called Skinner State Park, also known as Mount Holyoke. The mountain next to that, a developer announced just a year after I moved to this house, uh, so just a year after I moved to the neighborhood, that he was going to put 40 McMansions going up to the ridge line. And I'm like, that doesn't seem like a really good idea. And then I read further into the article and like all these people who should have known better, people in the environmental world were saying, oh, this is terrible, but there's nothing we can do. Well, that there's nothing we can do part is the red flag in front of the wall. It's like, it wasn't even the project itself that got me mad enough to take action. It was all these people saying they couldn't do anything about it. So I started a movement. My wife and I hosted the first meeting of Save the Mountain, expecting that 30 or 35 people would show up, five would get heavily involved, and we'd be a thorn in the side of the developer for five years or so, and eventually he would go away. Well, interestingly enough, we had 70 people jam themselves into my dining room. We had another 30 call saying, please keep us informed, I can't come tonight. We had, by the end of the meeting, an active core of 35, and it just got bigger and bigger. And we, I live in a town of about 5,000, by the way. And we, uh, over the 13 months of that campaign, we were able to consistently bring 400 or more people to public hearings. It was a big deal. When the dust settled, we won in 13 months flat, an almost complete victory. We did allow them to build two houses at the bottom, which was appropriate for the parcel. And this was the first time I had really, really used my marketing skills in community organizing on that kind of intense level. And I thought to myself, well, if I was so successful bringing the marketing world over to the social change side, what would happen if I brought some of the lessons from my organizing career into the marketing side? And that began a long evolution. I started writing about business ethics as a success strategy, and that led me very quickly to. Um, the, the other pieces like uh, how, how business eventually got to the point of looking at how business can actually solve things like hunger and poverty and war and catastrophic climate change. And that was really the, the, the genesis of the work that I'm doing now. Because people see, the, the people in social change, they too often see business as the enemy. It's out there to, to rape the earth and all this other stuff that I find is not actually true. That most business people really want to do the right thing. They just may be a little clueless about how to do it and still make a profit. Whereas on the business side, like, I would love to do this, but I can't afford it. And uh, so showing them that they actually can and can make money and that companies as ranging from a solopreneur like myself 
on up to Fortune 50 companies are actually doing very, very well by doing good. So there's the, the short answer of how I got here. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, yeah, you can feel free to always give the long answer too. And I think that's really important now. Like there's a, there's a lot of companies that will talk about going green and we obviously understand that we're having an impact and sometimes they'll call it like conscious business and some you know, refer to as conscious marketing. And um, this weekend I had the privilege to hang out with Unify in Vancouver and on Friday was uh, International Peace Day. Oh. Great. And so what they're doing is they're, they're orchestrating events around the world, uh, you know, Women's Empowerment, Peace Day, uh, Green Earth Day, things like that. So it's organizing socially, um, you know, to, for, to bring about a positive change. Um, the titles, you know, and what you're sharing about is like, you know, business, poverty to peace. Like there's so much we can touch on there. Like do you want to share either like some strategies or some philosophies on how we can start to do that, whether you're looking at getting into business and you want to adopt these philosophies right away, or you're already in business and you say, look, I'd like to go green, but this is how much money I'm making. This is, you know, now this is going to be more expensive. Kind of like the, it's a Patagonia story, which I really love. You're familiar with that one? I'm very familiar with Patagonia. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, maybe you could share that story, but that idea is like, how do we, what are some of the philosophies or ideas that we can start to move towards green and how can we use business to create more peace. It was International Peace Day. So your thoughts on peace in general would be awesome. Sure. Well, I again, I, I got my start really going to peace demonstrations in the Vietnam era. So this is a, a, an important cause to me. And I think too often we try to motivate through guilt and shame. And the reality is that guilt and shame almost never works. I, the only example in the business world I can think of where guilt and shame really changed a company's way of doing was Nike and the sweatshop campaign. That was guilt and shame working. But for every Nike, there are dozens and dozens of companies that like, we're, we're, we're gonna build a wall, we can't, we're gonna insulate ourselves from these attacks, this is more than we can handle. It doesn't work very well. So I decided to try enlightened self-interest, i.e. the profit motive. If businesses can see that they can actually make money doing the right thing, well, by golly, they're going to do the right thing. And I, I see example after example of companies that have done this. You mentioned Patagonia. I love Patagonia. They're, of course, an, an outdoor sportswear type of company. They are the only company I can ever think of that, without coercion, ran an ad saying, don't buy our product. They had the very famous don't buy this jacket ad that basically said, look in your closet, use what you already have. When it's worn out, then come see us. It's a brilliant ad. And, you know, typically when you see companies saying don't buy our stuff, it's because the government is forcing them to, like tobacco or alcohol companies where the product itself is kind of destructive. So that was a real difference. So Patagonia is a great example. Ben & Jerry's is a great example. You cannot interact with Ben & Jerry's without running into their social and environmental work whether it's uh, facilitating the hiring of people with physical or mental disabilities in their scoop shops, or being, I think, the first major ice cream company to go for fair trade and organic cocoa and coffee as their ingredients, or sponsoring solar festivals. They're very, very integral. What they say is really what they do. And even after they got bought out by Unilever, they're operational agreement with Unilever allows them a lot of independence. So that's a, a, another great example. And, and they've actually percolated some of this stuff up through Unilever. Unilever, which is a huge conglomerate, is in the process of getting B Corp certification. B Corp is an alternative model that allows you to consider other things besides short-term profit. Some I forget, it's, it's above 1,200 companies now have gone and gotten B Corp cert certification, and Unilever is by far the largest to try. And it's going to be a multi-year process. There are so many moving parts in that. But that they're, they're, they're trying to do this, I think, is just great. And I think that having Ben & Jerry's as one of their um, under companies, I think, is part of, of how they got there. And let's also look at why is it that Ben & Jerry's is a known name anyway? I mean, you got these two guys from northern Vermont who knew nothing about business, nothing about ice cream, and yet there are like 100 companies in the super premium ice cream space, and there are two of them with any significant market share, both over 40%. One is the Exxon of ice cream, that would be Haagen-Dazs, 
and uh, that, that's my nickname for them. Uh, yeah, they're cold, they're corporate, you don't have any sense really of the human beings behind the product. And then you've got these two hippies with their beards and they're on the package and they're doing outrageous marketing things like at the time haagen was owned by Pillsbury and was trying to keep um, Ben and Jerry's out of the coolers in supermarkets. So they did a campaign around what is the Doughboy, which is the Pillsbury mascot, afraid of. So like a cold corporate company just wouldn't do that. <laughs> they, they, they had fun with it and they built market share. So I, I like to say that the, the main reason that they were so successful is because if you've got your $5 and you're in the supermarket and you have a choice between a company with no particular sense of corporate ethics or one where everywhere you go, you see evidence of the good they're doing in the world, where are you going to put your five bucks? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And what it make, reminds me of is I watched a documentary a long time ago. I can't remember what it was, but it's basically the importance of where you put your money, like understanding that everything, every dollar you spend, wherever you put it, you're supporting something. And so if we become more of a conscious consumer, um, we can make a greater impact in the world just on understanding who we're buying it for, what kind of business ethics they have and, mm -hmm. and what they're contributing. Um, yeah, and, and keeping things local, keeping your dollars local is a piece of that. Yeah, um, and certainly, and we have we actually have an independent super premium ice cream shop in the next town that I often buy from, and their politics are quite good also, and yet they're they're keeping the money in the local community. So even beyond Ben and Jerry's, there are places you can go. But they're a company that unless you are in my part of the world, you won't have heard of them. So like you in Vancouver don't have that option of going to Harold's. <laughs> But you might have your own super premium scoop shop somewhere in Vancouver that um, that is worth supporting. Yeah, exactly. And there's a sign that I saw on social media once that said something like, um, when you buy from us, you're not giving, you know, helping somebody get like another corporate retreat. You're helping a little girl get skates or, you know what I mean? And, and dance yeah. lessons and all this kind of thing. And I thought that was really good. And it's something to think about as the consumer. Um, well, what I'm curious about because of the book, like, uh, you know, guerrilla marketing to heal the world is the actual title. Um, yeah. 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 Um, you know, what things like are, what elements are in there? How can we use business to heal the world? Because I think business, you know, when, like you said at the beginning, we think about businesses as the e evil empire, em empire like uh, the corporation documentary. I remember watching that a long time ago and be like, oh my God, these people have a lot of power. And they're, mm -hmm. a lot of them are not doing great things. So um, maybe you can talk about like the scales of business and what, what we can do to impact our pet planet in a positive mm -hmm. uh, manner using business. Yeah, they do have a lot of power. And when they use that power for good, they're able to leverage things in ways that we can't. I mean, I, in all my writing and speaking and consulting, I am never going to have as much impact on greening the supply chain as the decision that Walmart made years ago that its suppliers are going to have to be as green as possible and that they have very specific standards about what that means. Now, Walmart is about the opposite of the tree-hugging company. Their corporate culture is about as far from Ben & Jerry's or Patagonia as you can get. But Walmart understands dollars. And Walmart figured out about 20 years ago that they could sell stuff to people who want to be green and they could green their own operations and between the money they made and the money they saved, they would be stupid not to. Uh, they actually, uh, the last time I checked, Walmart sold more organic food than Whole Foods. And the really interesting thing to me is that they are selling that organic food to people who ain't never going to go to a Whole Foods in their life. They've created a whole nother 15 billion a year market selling organic food to people who never thought about organic before. I have a lot of issues with other things that Walmart does, its labor policies, its store siting, and I don't choose to shop there. But I am delighted that they had opened up the universe of natural food to people who weren't going to find it on their own. I give them kudos for that. I give them kudos for what they've done to reduce their own energy consumption and to design intelligently for the world that we live in now and not the world that we were in 50 years ago. So... And, and, and a lot of big companies, pretty much every large corporation has a sustainability department with, you know, a number of, of people on staff. I went to a conference last year called the Responsible Business Summit. The speakers were companies like Coca-Cola and Pirelli Tire and just a long, long list of companies that marquee names that everybody's heard of. 
And they're all doing this because they're all seeing the benefit. And some of them are even pushing the envelope on the social change piece. They're doing things to work on hunger and poverty and war and catastrophic climate change. And one of the things I think is key is to develop products and services or reposition the ones you have to work on those issues. And I'll give you a great example, Matt. There's uh, quite a few companies now that are making solar powered LED lamps. As we all know, LED lamps use far less energy than even compact fluorescents, which in turn use far less energy than um, the old fashioned incandescent bulb. And not only do they use less energy, but they also last longer. In fact, I'll go on a little tangent here. Several years ago, back when I used to have my Green and Profitable monthly column, I did an analysis of what a company that had a high roof, a high ceiling, like let's say a sports stadium, an arena, and what their cost is in changing a light bulb is not the money for the light bulb. It's hiring the person to drive the bucket loader out on the ice um, and go up on the ladder on the, on the uh, escalator scaffolding thing to go and change the light bulb. That's the real cost to them. And especially now that LED lamps are down around a dollar a piece. At the time I did this analysis, they were about 10. But even at 10, I figured that over the life of an LED bulb of 15 years or so, if that arena owner didn't have to change 50 extra bulbs a year, the savings was going to be $4 million. So, so, you know, make the economic case for this stuff. Um, go for the low-hanging fruit. But LEDs in a different capacity in these solar lights, let's look at what they do. Let's say you're, you know, some remote place in, let's just say, Rwanda, and you're in a village, and you work in the fields all day, and then you come home, and you light your kerosene lamp, and you can kind of sort of see well enough to, to cook your dinner, but you're also, you're breathing toxic fumes and maybe the kerosene spills and it sets your house on fire. It's horrible. It's polluting, it's toxic, it's fire prone. The light is crap. And yet they haven't seen any alternative. And of course, it's a, a fossil non-renewable fuel. So if you're making, let's say $20 as a household monthly income and you're paying $2 of that to kerosene, that's enormous cut in your economic ability. Now, you replace that with the celery LED, and maybe the lamp costs 20 bucks. And let's say that you work out that the same $2 a month that they were paying for kerosene goes to pay for the lamp. So, okay, the first 10 months, their household budget doesn't change. Then on month 11, they get to keep the $2, and every month since, and all of a sudden, they have 10% more purchasing power. They have better quality light, so they can do a little cottage industry after dinner. Their kids can see to do their homework better and get better grades and better jobs later. And the person who has sold them the system has a very good job supplying and servicing the, the solar lamps. And you've eliminated the toxicity, you've eliminated the fire risk, and you've made the world better, you've made people's lives better, and there's basically no losers in this. The company's making a healthy profit. So what's not to love? Right. Well, you know, it seems like it makes sense when you when you put it like that. I'm just curious how, you know, are you seeing like this this movement on a micro scale within small businesses or oh, sure. big, yeah. big businesses or both? And then um, kind of the next question I had is a little bit of a digress, but not completely. Um, you have a lot of experience in business, entrepreneurship, marketing, right? So you've got different scales of that you've got the person that wants to do something they're passionate about start a business but there's so many elements to it it's it's challenging and it's frightening and it's risky right and if they do it they're probably going to want to go the green route they're probably going to want to make a positive impact and when their business is successful they can influence their community they can sponsor a local sports team mm -hmm. um, they can do all kinds of things with that with that power with that monetary power then you've got the kind of um, scale where they're relatively successful entrepreneurs, you know, they have their business in order, it's making money, it's, it's successful. So I'm just curious if you could provide like, like a general overarching philosophy of like, hey, if you want to get into business and entrepreneurship and marketing here, are like some simple elements, like from ground up, right, get your idea, here are some basic marketing tactics. And here are some philosophies and ideas to stay green and stay congruent in, in a conscious way, because a lot of the stuff that I get on the podcast is, you know, people curious, but they don't know how to do it because there's so much. And I'm just wondering with your experience, what advice you'd have for those people? 
Okay, well, you asked me about a 10 part question there, so I'll, I'll do as many parts as I can remember. <laughs> Uh, first of all, basic marketing. One of the things that I look for is who will benefit from my success and how can I partner with them? And this turns the whole thing on its head. This incidentally is the strategy that Bill Gates used to create an empire at Microsoft. Microsoft was a nothing company until he got the contract to supply operating systems from the original IBM PC. So he was using IBM's enormous marketing cloud to build his company. I, as a guerrilla marketing author, I used that strategy in partnering with the late J. Conrad Levinson. I provided the subject matter expertise, he provided the branding. And I did most of the writing, but, um, and people said, why are you doing this? You're not getting anything out of it. I said, oh yes, I am. Um, first, I got a contract with a major publisher, John Wiley, that I would not have necessarily gotten on my own. Uh, second, I have the Gorilla brand now behind me for the rest of my life. I'm a Gorilla marketing author. I'm part of the most famous marketing brand in history. Uh, third, I had the captive audience of, at the time, 84,000 people on his mailing list, and on and on and on. And basically, Wiley at that time was paying about $15,000 for books from mid-list authors without a big reputation. So if I had managed to get a contract with Wiley on my own, I would have gotten $15,000. So when I asked them if I could bring Jay in if he wanted to do it, and they said, oh, we get two marketing superstars, we like it. They offered me 25,000, I said, I have to share it with Jay, can you go any higher? And they said 30, and 30 divided by two, my share is $15,000. So I lost not a penny on co collaborating, and I gained so much. And you see this in the internet marketing world, you see how many people have built their empires by having their friends mail for them and paying their friends a usually 50% commission on whatever sales are generated. So you can start with zero and if you have the right friends, you can get running very quickly, okay? Also marketing, too many people market in what I call we, we, we all the way home. It's like, look at me, I'm great, I did this thing. And like, no, no. Look at what my product or service can do for your life to make your life better. Look at what my product or suit can do, service can do to make the planet better. Uh, look at the end benefits and market those. Um, interestingly enough, I, I just saw and blogged about this morning uh, a page on HubSpot that talked about some guerrilla marketing examples they liked. And one of them was from Bounty Paper Towels and they had like this huge statue of a melting popsicle in the middle of some busy New York intersection. And the, the message was that no matter how big your mess is, use Bounty to clean it up. And I thought that was brilliant. So taking it green, we are seeing more and more that customers actually demand green and demand social change. Uh, this is, again, you look at a company like The Body Shop. The Body Shop was so much built on social change, the cosmetics company out of the UK. And because people want to do the right thing, if they have a choice of buying cosmetics from the body shop or buying cosmetics from some cold corporate thing that they can't relate to, they're going to go with the body shop. So you're going to see that if you're not green enough, people will start asking questions. I don't know when the last time you went to a hotel that didn't have the sign about, uh, please put your towels on the floor if you want them changed, and if not, leave them to use again. That is a cost-saving measure that was extremely effectively marketed as a environmental measure. And the nice thing is that many environmental measures are cost saving. It costs you less to use less resources, usually. And that's what a lot of green is. So let's see, there were many other pieces to your question and I'm letting them slip out of my brain. So give me a refresher here. <laughs> Yeah, well, I appreciate those answers. I, I threw a lot at you. Um, I think, you know, you answered them really well, too. It, you, you know, with marketing and, and things like that in business, I just, I just for when I'm talking to people, I'll talk about just do what, it, what are you doing to help? Um, and, you know, one of the ways to have a life that's empowering for yourself is to do something good for others. So if you're creating a business or an idea that helps someone else in some way, that's a good thing. You know, and if not, why are you in business ultimately? It's, it should not, your goal should not be only to make money. Your goal should be to make money while doing things that make people's lives better. And I, again, I, I think the companies that don't have this are going to be at a big disadvantage. If you cannot justify what you do environmentally and in terms of its social impact, 
people are going to flock away from you because people like doing business with those who promote their values. And we've seen this for hundreds of years. This is not new. The scale of it is new. And also another thing that's new is the scale of retribution if you do it wrong. Um, it used to be that there's the, one of the memes in marketing going into the 70s and 80s, well, if, if people like you, they'll tell three of your, their friends. And if they hate you, they'll tell 10. Well, the video United Breaks Guitars, the last time I checked, it had 17 million views. So 17 million people, at least, have seen a video talking about how United did not handle fragile baggage appropriately and was not responsive when the customer complained. That is not the kind of PR you want. <laughs> so now in social media, we all have, we're all our own publishers. Anybody can put out a message and you have no idea what's going to go viral. <laughs> and, uh, and people, let me tell you, when I say you have no idea, I mean the most prominent marketing geniuses of our time. All they can do is guess. Nobody really knows why something takes off and something else doesn't. Uh, Tom Paxton actually wrote a song back in the 80s called Thank You Republic Airlines for breaking the neck of my guitar. Same thing. And you know, there's probably 40, 50,000 people that have heard that song. And 17 million have heard uh, the, uh, forget the name of the group now, Sons of Something or Other, uh, United Breaks Guitars. It's basically the same scenario, but one went viral and the other didn't. Of course, Tom Paxton didn't have the internet in the 1980s. <laughs> but um, all, it's being congruent also. I, I, having what I call the magic triangle of integrity, honesty, and quality. If you run your business on that principle, you really can't go wrong. Oh, I, lo I love that part. I was actually just taking notes when you said it. Can you say that one more time? The magic the triangle. The magic triangle, honesty, integrity, and quality. If you have all three of those, you're going to be in good shape. And that's not just in terms of how you run your business, but in who you choose to do business with. So I, I will turn down clients if I feel like there's not a match with the honesty, the integrity, or the quality. Um, or with my own integrity. Like if somebody asks me to promote some homophobic racist thing, I will say I'm not the right marketer for you. Because, and I, I can even say to them, if I were to do this for you, I wouldn't be able to do a good job because it doesn't represent who I am. So you're going to get a crappy product that you don't want. So go find somebody who, who shares your values to do that for you. Yeah, I love. Well, I think my favorite thing of all that was the magic triangle, and it's what I was thinking about when you're sharing about what may or may not go viral because um, that forces integrity. And I think that if you're in business, you should you should probably have some integrity with what you're putting out there for other people. And I would say uh, having a lot, having consistent, not just some. Yeah, having all the integrity, you know, going, <laughs> going, going, ideally. Um, and so, yeah, it kind of led me back to like, um, you know, the curiosity of what I'm thinking is, okay, in, in the book, it says uh, combining principles and profit to create the world we want. I love that. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing tagline. And um, you have a, an endorsement, I think it's from Jack Canfield that says, um, Jay and Shell show how to lift people out of poverty and into profit. And I think that's an interesting um, two taglines. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate on more of those on like how we can move into that because the original question was if you're looking at getting into entrepreneurship, just, I think a lot of it's like psychology and people know where to start and they don't know how to market and it's, mm -hmm. and it's scary. And then there's a, the, the other element of people who are in business, but they're just, they're more looking for the profit, right? And how they can get things and how could they like add an element to like, Hey, do you realize the power you have? You might not, you might not understand that with this business, wherever you are on the success scale, you could be doing a lot of positive impact if you understood, you know, this idea or philosophy. Yeah. And again, business has the power to leverage this much more than we do. Although ordinary people who are not in business can also make a difference. And we should come back and revisit that later because I have some things to say about that. But I'll try to, to answer the questions that you just put out there. Um, and also, I do remember that one of the pieces that I didn't respond to in your last question was about scaling up. And that I, I'm a solopreneur and I've chosen to stay a solopreneur. I have no employees. I have some freelancers that I work with, but basically I'm on my own. And on the other end of things, you have Fortune 50 companies like General Motors, General Electric, Walmart that are figuring out that they need to be leaders in this area. 
So I think it can scale. I think it's maybe a little trickier, but in some ways it's easier because you have this big reach that I don't have. I don't have people hanging on my every word if I put out a tweet. <laughs> there are people in the, well, Bill Gates does. <laughs> and so when you build a company like Microsoft, you are creating reach for yourself. So trying to remember now what the point I was going to make about the next part was. Could you repeat it? I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Yeah, I've, and I'm throw, I, I'm throwing a lot at you. So, well, we're discussing either if you're getting into business or yeah, you're okay. in business. Yeah. So, if you're in business, you have a way of making the world better, no matter what kind of business you're in, except maybe if you're generating nuclear power. Or, uh, you know, uh, there are things that, that would be hard to make a, a social consciousness case for. Um, and in fact, nuclear power, that's a, an industry that is known for its greenwashing. And uh, I could go on for a long time about why nuclear power is not smart. I wrote a whole book on it, but we'll just save that for another time. But what sh it, it, let's just say I was once on a show like this and the, the host said to me, what would you do for a pizza shop that wants to incorporate social change? And I'd never been asked that before. And I said, hmm, well... Let's see, if the pizza shop were to reach out to the local high school and say, I will teach you the skills of growing organic tomatoes and onions and garlic and oregano, and I will teach you the skills of making pizzas, and you can sell pizzas at school lunches and uh, make an income by doing that. Uh, and again, I'm always looking for how everybody can win. I'm not a believer in win-lose. I'm a believer in win, 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 win. And usually it's possible if you think hard enough and creatively enough. So you're creating jobs for these inner city teenagers. You're giving them skills that they'll have for the rest of their lives. They will never not know how to grow a tomato again or how to uh, make that tomato into a pizza. They will learn the entrepreneurship skill of going out and soliciting customers in their school. That money stays in the community, of course. And again, it's just multiple benefits for a very simple thing. Meanwhile, the pizza operator probably is doing this on a Monday or Tuesday night when there's not a lot of activity in the pizza shop otherwise. So turning dead time and space into productive time and space. So that's just an example. And that was one, I didn't come up with it right now, but I came up with it on the spot when I was asked by a podcast host. Yeah, it's a really good example. When you when you shared, it rem reminds me. I read you said there's many guerrilla marketing books, but I remember reading one a long time ago. And then it was so simple the idea of like you know people aren't going around in their community looking for these scenarios where they can benefit each other. And that's just mm -hmm. a really good example of getting involved in your community, helping people, those around you, creating a win, win, win. Now it's like, what can I get? It's like, what can I give? How can I help? How does this support everybody? And when you change that thinking, you know, you should be successful um, defined by natural law, if that makes sense. Like natural, the way the universe works, if you're trying to help people and it does help, then you should be supported by your environment, by nature, by basically the laws that govern the universe. And you're going to feel good, which is the ultimate thing. You're actually making a, a positive impact and that should and can scale up. Yeah. And when it does scale up, if you look at the Mondragon uh, co-op movement in Spain, for example, I forget if it was 40,000 or 100,000 people were involved with that. It had huge scale and it was across tentacles of multiple industries. And you see these synergies and you see them also, uh, this is a, a more recent example and maybe a more exciting one. The idea of looking at business cyclically so that the waste from one business becomes the input stream for another business. And up, uh, you mentioned that you had been to Vermont for the first time uh, a little while ago. And in Vermont, there's a place called the Intervale in um, north, northern Vermont, actually quite close to where Ben and Jerry's got their started. Um, and at the Intervale, there's a brewery. And then they take the spent grain from the brewery and it goes to a farmer who grows shiitake mushrooms and sells them to restaurants. And then the mushroom waste becomes um, food, I think, for a tilapia crop. And then the fish waste from the tilapia goes back to the grain fields where they're growing the grain for the beer. 
and you've created a closed loop. And I think we need to look at always, we need to look at the concept of waste as being outmoded. I have a deck on my side door, not this one, that is made of recycled plastic bottles. And it's great. And this deck that, that is wood, we have to stain it or paint it every couple of years. That one has had no maintenance for like 15 years. And it still looks pretty good. So if we can turn plastic waste into building materials and keep it out of the landfill, that's a good thing. And if we can get those plastics from biodegradable sources rather than petrochemicals, that's a good thing. And there are now many, many agriculturally based plastics as opposed to petrochemical based ones. So when I go to the cafe next door, they're going to give me my food with a compostable straw and a compostable fork. And we, we need to look for all of those opportunities. And we need to think about where we grow food. Yes, we grow food out in big fields like the one that I live next to. But we can also grow food. I remember being shocked when I visited a friend who lived in a basement apartment in Providence, Rhode Island, very urban place. And she had tomatoes and basil on her windowsill with the tiny amount of sunlight that, that she got. There were small tomatoes. There was a dwarf plants, but she was able to do that. Rooftops are a tremendous resource. Rooftops are a source for solar energy or wind energy and also for food. And why should we be cutting down forests to put up solar farms? Why not put solar farms on top of the land that we've already cleared and have buildings on top of it? Yeah, it makes sense. Or what we've clear cut in the forest already. You know, just use that. It's like, oh, it's clear cut already. Um, maybe not that, because the tree's got to grow back. As I'm saying it, well, I realize how dumb it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're not in, you and I don't live in a climate where bamboo is particularly thriving. But I, I remember writing about in Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World, a house building uh, ven venture that was using bamboo. And instead of cutting the whole tree down, they would just take the branches they need and that bamboo grows back really quickly. Yeah, I've heard about that in, in Bali. There's these um, architects that are making these extraordinary structures out of bamboo. Um, somebody, when I was working with, um, uh, I can't remember now, but like a organization, oh, oh uh, the International Committee for Natural Justice and uh, the New Earth Project. And so they're, you know, using that as a resource because it grows like crazy and they can build sustainable housing out there. Um, yeah, so rather than cut down a 200-year-old oak tree, um, cut back a 20-year-old bamboo, and yep. then it'll be back to you in two or three years, and you'll be ready to cut it again. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Um, you know, all of this, again, it's like really grounded in, in practical thinking and understanding and philosophy. I was just curious, did you look at in your book or anything that you looked at um, as far as like the large scale, we still have a, a problem with, um, you know, like wage, I don't know, what, what do you call it? It's like slave labor or things like that. Like just those sweatshops. working sweatshops, um, all the really terrible stuff. Like did, did any of the research or, or your book look at how we could positive, positively impact that? Um, the only idea that I have right now, as I'm saying it is um, don't support the things that you know that are using sweatshops and buy a different exactly. product. Um, just curious if you looked at that at all. I didn't really look at it. I have a friend actually named Liana Foxvogue, who's an expert on that. I did have her as a guest on my radio show some years back. Um, and I'm not remembering the name of the organization that she works with, but there are organizations out there very committed to sweat-free labor practices. And again, as demand increases, just like one of the things that I did in my life to avoid slave labor is years ago, when I found out how most chocolate was farmed using child slaves, I started only buying fair trade chocolate. And I also prefer to buy organic fair trade chocolate because I like to promote my own health also. And I eat, quite frankly, a lot of chocolate, a lot of very, very dark chocolate. To me, if it doesn't have 60% cacao or better, it's not chocolate. It's chocolate flavored sugar. <laughs> but that's just me. I will actually eat cacao beans, 100% <laughs> pure. But um, when I started that, it was really tough to find decent chocolate that was fair trade. Now it's ridiculously easy. I can go even into the, the discount store, the store that sells remainders, and I can find 
six or eight or 10 different brands of organic fair trade chocolate. And even some of the big players, Hershey has been forced to come to the table. Uh, Mars was actually earlier than Hershey and, and more voluntary. Uh, there was a group called Green America that really pushed on Hershey uh, after they got Mars. And uh, successfully, they're shifting. They're, it's going to take a while. But I did notice also that their premium brand, Scharfenberger, which I had stopped buying because it was not fair trade. And now that particular part of Hershey's is fair trade. So I can buy it if I want to. But I, I don't want to be a party to slave labor in the Ivory Coast. So I buy my chocolate accordingly. It's again, going back to putting your money where your values are. Right. Awesome. Well, it does seem like it's moving in a little bit of a positive direction, which is nice. And like you said, with the social media, the good marketing or the bad viral marketing, you know, companies are being held accountable for their actions um, more than they were in the past. So that is a good thing. Um, you, you touched on something that you wanted to elaborate on earlier when you were, you're talking about how someone who isn't in business ah. can affect social ordinary change. people on social change. Okay. Yes. What's more ordinary than a seamstress? Okay, well, oh. <laughs> here, in, here in the country, in, um, in Montgomery, Alabama, in I think the year was 1955, a seamstress named Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus. Now, she was an ordinary seamstress, but she was also active in the resistance to American apartheid. Uh, she was involved with her NAACP chapter. She'd been trained at the Highlander Center, which was a social justice organizing community in Tennessee. But you know, she was a seamstress. Um, in Poland, an electrician working in a shipyard named Lech Walesa kicked the Russians out and became the president. In, um, in India, an, a nun, <laughs> Mother Teresa, made more of a difference on deep-seated systemic poverty than probably any other human being that has walked the earth. And she was just an ordinary nun. Martin Luther King was a pastor of a small church. You know, the, basically, with all of these people, the door opened for greatness, and they stepped through it, not because they wanted to become great, but because they wanted to do something meaningful. The greatness followed them. It was not something they sought. Many of these people were actually somewhat shy and, and even a little introverted and um, reluctant to take the, the center stage. Uh, Lois Gibbs was a housewife. She started the right to know about toxics movement after discovering that her entire neighborhood was contaminated by industrial waste, a neighborhood called Love Canal in Niagara Falls, New York. I could keep listing examples. There's, there's many, many more. I'll stop there. But ordinary people can make a difference. And here's a key with that. Ordinary people make a lot more of a difference when they work with other people, ordinary or not ordinary. I and mean, I started the movement that saved the mountain next to that movement. I'm one guy working from a farmhouse in Massachusetts. I don't have any big celebrity platform. You know, I, I've written some best-selling books, but they're best-selling in a niche. <laughs> I'm not a household word. And yet, in my community, I had an impact. And I've had other impacts. I, the community where I lived before, which is across the river from the one where I live now, is kind of a restaurant destination. And I worked with my city councilor in, my goodness, 1984 to get the first non-smokers rights regulations in that town and one of the first in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it was some of the easiest social change work I've ever done and some of the most rewarding. And interestingly enough, the number of restaurants in that town skyrocketed when they realized that people could get a meal there without getting smoke in their faces. A lot of the restaurants, the, the original law said you have to have 25% set aside for non-smoking. Once they did that, they saw very quickly that the demand was for the non-smoking seats. And many of the restaurants went to three quarters or even no smoking at all. And by the, town, by the time the town finally passed a, you're not allowed to smoke in restaurants anymore law, the vast majority of the restaurants in town were already non-smoking voluntarily. So that was something I did, just, you know, me and my city councilor. That's amazing. And I think it's really important. I like how you say like ordinary people. I think we're all ordinary people, you know, like it's not like, you know, everybody's an ordinary person. And it reminds me of that quote. It says, uh, 
Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Um, no, I, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's a really great quote. And, and it's like we forget that we can actually make an impact in our community. You know, if let's say you have a kid and they join a local sports team. And, you know, for me, having an athletic background, if I coach and I just volunteer coaching or, you know, if you have an ice cream shop and you sponsor the kids' jerseys and you get a, a few – um, memberships for, for families who can't afford it or just something like that, something that actually has meaning. And I think that that was a really uh, great quote and idea that's saying grace, greatness came from the desire to do something meaningful. And there was an opportunity presented to take that a little bit further. So I think that those are really beautiful points. Um, yeah, I'm going to follow that up with another quote that's from the book. It's a quote by Muhammad Ali. Um, and I just need to get um, into that screen. Here we go. Um, yeah, this is, I, I quote this in the book, Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World, and I also used it as the basis for my TEDx talk. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Um, and that's how I've chosen to live my life. I mean, people say, how can you possibly make a difference on stuff like hunger and poverty and war that's been around for thousands of years or climate change that's going to take us down in the next hundred years? Like, well, think about all the impossible, quote unquote, things of 50 years ago that are now totally possible now. Who would have thunk it that we can carry the world's knowledge around in our pockets? Yeah, who, who would have believed that you and I are talking over essentially television from a, a computer that lives in our house? I, 50 years ago, a computer cost millions of dollars and filled a room that was 40 feet long and required its own cooling system and required special, um, I'll call them the priesthood of people who could talk to the computer with punch cards, which are not easy to use. And now we talk in normal voices, we type with normal keyboards, and we can communicate anywhere in the world. We can access the, the entire store of knowledge in the world, or almost the entire store of knowledge in the world. And we take all these things for granted, and we do it over high-speed broadband that even 20 years ago was really not doable. We could not be having video conferencing 20 years ago because our signal would have broken up right when we started. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And even just being in, you know, podcasting for three years, the tech technological advancements have been astounding and how much easier it is to, you know, bring that out. And I, and I think that that quote that you said, you know, I just kind of want to bring that back to like the Muhammad Ali is like this idea imposed in people, right? It's, it's really, it's the belief that you have right away in the perspective and what you think is possible. Just like the four minute mile, four minute miles, not mm -hmm. possible. Nobody can do it. Somebody does it. Then everybody does it. You know, it's yeah, once Roger, Roger Bannister did it. Then I think within the next year, there were like 20 other people that did it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that's an important idea to start with. It's just like, what, what is the idea that you're holding? You know, when we realize that we have more power than, mm -hmm. you know, to affect positive change, to create a life that we want to create or whatever the case is, um, we can move forward, you know, it, with a little bit of hope. And I'm wondering if, do you want to like, cause you did a Ted talk um, on why, uh, what's the title of it? Um, I wrote it down somewhere. Impossible is a dare. Impossible is a dare. Quote. Yeah. So do you want to, do you want to touch on that a little bit and like the, the idea behind that? Yeah, it is this idea that we can make a difference on these deep-seated problems. I, my old friend, Dave Dellinger, who is deceased now, but he was actually, um, he was one of the Chicago Eight Defendants, and I, I went up to him at a peace rally, a small peace rally, and I just told him I really liked his speech, and at that time, I didn't know who he was, um, and we became friends, and he wrote a book called More Power Than We Know, which is about that we can, in fact, make a difference, uh, ordinary folks, and he was somebody who was a peace activist for decades. And if you look at, for example, okay, of those four issues, let's look at peace because people see that as the hardest. How are you going to achieve peace? We, we, people have always been fighting. You go back to the Bible and you see fights. 
Um, in fact, the, the Bible proves my point because all the way back to the Old Testament, all the way back to Abraham, what are these wars about? They're about resources. You have my land. I want your water. Stuff like that. And especially in places like the Middle East where water is very scarce. So if you look at solving world peace as a resource issue, all sorts of things become possible that aren't possible if you just see it as ethnic conflict or, or whatever. But the ethnic conflicts are built on the resource conflict. So if you take away the underlying need to fight because somebody else is claiming your land, that changes things. So by ensuring that everyone has enough to eat, by ensuring that everyone has a decent place to live, it doesn't have to be a castle, but it should have four walls and a roof and maybe indoor plumbing. <laughs> Although there are ways of doing it without indoor plumbing, but um, at least four walls and a roof. And you know, have, having a food supply that they can count on reliably. When you do those things, you create an economic engine for improvement that not only bypasses the need for war, but actually makes war unattractive. So again, it's this big systemic kind of thinking. It's looking not just at the close-up look but also at the 30,000 foot view, and you need both. I like to say that I'm, I'm somebody, one of the things that differentiates me as a consultant is I do look at both the forest and the trees because they're interrelated. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I like that idea of, of even just bringing the idea that peace is possible. You know, some people, they just want to give up before they start. They don't even want to try. And just having the idea and, and planting the seeds like, hey, you know, yeah, impossible is a dare. Like, look at it and there is a pot. And you're not going to be able to find a solution unless you think about it and believe one is possible. It might not be easy. Um, yeah. Probably not. That be mindset, Matt, is just so key. If you believe it's possible, it becomes a lot more possible. With Save the Mountain, the biggest struggle we had was convincing people that winning was possible. Once we did that, we won very, very quickly. I, I, I thought it would take five years. It took 13 months. And the reason it took 13 months is because we, in that 13 months, changed the perception of the community from, oh, there's nothing we can do to, okay, which of the various arrows in our quiver is going to be the one that, that finally does this project in? And it turned out to be uh, uh, that I, as the founder of the group, didn't even know what was happening until just three days before it was announced. There was a legal strategy going on that ultimately helped us win that involved a donor stepping forward, being so impressed by the work we were doing community organizing that she bought the land for us and gave it to the state. <laughs> that was not a solution I saw coming even a week before it happened. Mm. The legal committee just kept saying, we're working on it. Don't worry. Trust us. And we decided that in spite of all logic, we would trust them. And uh, it, it worked. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but they were, they were not wanting anybody to leak it out. So they were being very, very tight-lipped about it. Um, but, you know, all of these things, it, it's just, uh, you look at peace again. And the world that my parents were born into in the 1930s, was a world in which Europe and South America, all, all of the countries in those continents were pretty much at war with each other like all the time. I just read an article yesterday, I think it was, about the peace treaty between Peru and Ecuador um, in the 1970s after 175 years of armed contesting of the border. And they made peace. You look at Europe, you look at the EC, the EU rather, um, showing my age now, I'm calling it the EC. <laughs> um, you, you look at how countries that used to be bitter enemies like France and Germany, how many wars did they fight? And now they're allies. And not only are they allies, but the whole common market is really a place where there aren't really wars going on between the countries in there. That's a remarkable development. You look at Ireland and Northern Ireland. In the 1970s, that was probably the most heavily fortified and patrolled border in the world. Now, I went there in, I think it was 2012, and we were staying in, um, up in, in Donegal, right by the border with Northern Ireland, and a lot of the work we were doing in this program, which was a peace education program, uh, in which, people who had been shooting each other, Catholics and Protestants, were now making peace together and leading educational workshops together. 
And that was all in Derry in Northern Ireland. So we had to cross the border a lot. And finally, the third time that we crossed the border, I said, okay, I am really going to focus on spotting the border. Oh, there's some flags. Use miles. That was the border. Because hmm. in, in, um, in Donegal, they're on the metric system. They use kilometers. And uh, in, in Northern Ireland, they use the English system. That was the only way I knew was the flags and the sign that said, we're, we're changing the way you look at uh, how far you're going. <laughs> the most fortified border in the world had made peace. I'm hoping that with this Brexit craziness that they're able to maintain that. I do know that there is now a lot of energy on both sides of that border to maintain an open border because now families are on both sides, people work on one side, live on the other side. It's gonna be a big mess if they try to make that into like the sort of border that many countries have between them. That open border has been really good for the economies of both of those countries. I hoped in my life, see that happening with Israel and Palestine. That's a much tougher one, but it can be done. It can be done. Even a 3000 year old conflict like that. Hmm. Well, I really like that example. It's definitely inspiring when you look at the history of, of humanity. Sometimes if you look at all the problems, it can get a little bit dark. And you're like, oh, mm -hmm. my God, there's so much crap out there and so much conflict and um, need for improvement, and like earth need for need, needs improvement. Um, yeah. And you can contribute to that improvement. And there is inspiring examples that show that as a community, um, as an individual, then into community, because you just planted an idea with your, um, you know, with that mountain, that's all it is for any idea, you planted an idea, and then you basically said, Hey, guys, Anybody else think this is a good idea? And then when you work together, amazing things can happen. Um, and that's the power of community. And so, yeah. you know, even yeah. just planting the idea of something that you see in the world that you, you have an issue with and want to improve, that's your thing. You know, yeah. just, just throw out a flag and say, hey, I would like to improve this. Does anybody else want to come play with me and, you know, give this a shot and making a positive impact? And worst case scenario, you're going to learn something. You're probably going to make a friend or two. Yeah, and interestingly enough, with Save the Mountain, one of the things that we did really well was cross all ideological, all career, all, all class boundaries. This was during the 2000 presidential election here in the United States, and uh, there were three major candidates in that race. Um, Al Gore, who was the Democrat, George W. Bush, who was the Republican, and Ralph Nader, who was the Green Party candidate. And I could drive around my neighborhood at that time and see lawn signs for Save the Mountain on lawns that also had signs for any of those three candidates. And I, I was kind of surprised to see that there would be signs for Bush and signs for Save the Mountain on the same lawn. But I was thrilled because I believe you have to talk to each other when you disagree. I have a Facebook friend who ran for Congress on a platform well to the right of Donald Trump. He and I argue a lot. Um, and I'm very glad that he lost his primary. <laughs> I don't want that man in Congress. But, you know, we have respectful dialogue about where can we agree and where do we disagree. And it's mostly disagree. But we, in order to be who we are, we both feel it's important to talk to the other. And I, I feel that very, very strongly. A lot of the things I've done in my life have been about dialoguing with people who are different. I, I just went to a program yesterday on, uh, the, with the author of a book called How to Be a Muslim. And I'm not a Muslim, you know, I'm Jewish. Jews are supposed to be the enemies of Muslims. And I have found that I've been able to build many bridges into the Muslim community. And I, I value those friendships a lot. And I'm, I'm very glad to have those people in my life. Um, there's, there's just so many ways in which, you, you know, when you get into the like, I'm not gonna talk to terror, like, if you're gonna make peace, you have to make peace with the people who don't agree with you. You have to make people, peace with the people who are fighting with you. If you're talking to the choir, you're not going to make peace. You're going to feel good, but you're not going to change anything. So I, I want to go for that deep change. I want my legacy. I'm 61 years old. I figure I've got another probably 20 to 30 years, maybe more, to do what I can do to make the world better. And I want the world to be better because I've lived in it. And um, I think it will be. I think, I think it already has been. And I think there's a lot more I can do. I'm not yet living up to my potential as an agent of change. But I feel like at 57, four years ago, when I changed the focus of my work to do this big picture stuff, I felt like for the first time in my life, I knew what I wanted to do when I grew up <laughs> at 57. 
And aging is another thing that we, I, I had the privilege in my 20s of being an organizer for a group called the Grey Panthers, most of whom were in their 70s and 80s. And they were great role models for me. I, that's what I, when I'm 80, I want to still be out there on doing this good work. Amazing. Well, I love all that. And I appreciate the shift and well, the, the direct intention It's beautiful. And I think the point you made about peace, you know, being able to communicate with those you disagree with, that's it. It's, you know, you don't even need to um, believe them. That's the whole thing. I just spent the summer with a Native American elder of the Mi'kmaq, David Lone Bear Center Pass, and he's a very extraordinary human being like extremely extraordinary and his elders taught him how to have peace he was taught by apparently over 600 elders for the first 26 years of his life and he's just and he looks at the non-natives right the whites europeans everybody else and he's just like you guys just need to be kind to each other essentially to, to be in the own room to have your own beliefs not to say one person needs to believe another thing but you know don't stab the person beside you you know like just have you can have a different point of view but allow that to just be um, and then be able to be in the same room with yeah. one another. And cause at the end of the day, we're human beings, you know, and we yeah. all want the same things. And if you look at like, if you look at somebody who would be totally different, like a Muslim um, extremist, and then maybe like whatever the polar opposite of that is, maybe a, a white Texas Navy seal. That's like all about whatever the case is. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to draw two different um, people their motives of their humanity are the same. Mm -hmm. They probably want family. They want security. They want freedom. They want food. They want shelter. They want good for their community. Um, and, but they have this idea planted in the, in their, in, in what's going on that that person is the enemy and we're not looking for conflict resolution. We're, we're kind of like fueling that fire. And I understand it's far more complicated than that, but you but know, that is, I mean, if you assume that people have ultimately good intentions, and their methods are different and their values are different, that gives you the beginning of the, of the ability to build that bridge. And that's a very powerful thing. And, you know, I, I see, I, I have made a point of keeping people in my life who I vehemently disagree with, not just that Trumpista I was mentioning, um, but um, my own sister voted for Trump and we have had some painful conversations about that, but we still love each other and we still, recognize that each of us is doing what they think is good for the world. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not going to go there, <laughs> but, um, but when I, I think also, you know, we do get hung up in what's wrong with the world. And I try to look at what's right back in March, 2018, I started a daily gratitude journal posting on Facebook and I, I, my Facebook page is, is open. I don't protect posts from non-followers. So if anybody find, looks for S-H-E-L dot H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z, uh, facebook.com slash shell dot Horowitz, you will come to my Facebook page and you will see, as of this writing, I think it's 182 daily journals on Facebook expressing gratitude. And it's been an interesting thing. I did it in part because there was so much negativity from both the left and right in my Facebook feed. But I'm finding that there's a lot of, of resonance in my life for doing this practice. And there are days that it's very, very hard. There was one day that I lost a day of vacation and was stranded in Florida because my plane never took off. <laughs> there was another day more recently when my stepfather was killed in a crosswalk. And each of those days, I did my gratitude journal. The day that my stepfather was killed, I expressed the entire journal was expressing gratitude for who he was in my life and what he had meant to me over the past 50 years. It was hard to write that, but I'm really glad I did. And interestingly enough, I think that my next book might be some of the choice excerpts from this gratitude journal, <laughs> which will be a real departure for me. I haven't written a non-marketing book in a very long time. The last one came out in 1995. And uh, of my 10 books, eight of them are about marketing. And I've never written a book on a personal growth area like this. But I think, I think there's something in there that's worth sharing. I, I think the idea of being grateful for things, even when a lot of things are going wrong, it really shifts your focus. And it may end up being some of the most important things I ever do, is, is working, bringing this to light and helping people experience it. 
That's beautiful, man. I appreciate you sharing that. And I think, you know, I've heard about the gratitude journals. I've done that before. And, you know, you can't focus on two things at once. You know, you can't focus on how the world is terrible and how there is possibility and hope. And it's the hope that brings change. You know, it, it's both real. You know, they're both as real as you want to, you know, focus your attention on. And if we're stuck in one way, in one idea or philosophy, like one of the examples that I use on the podcast is like if Americans use like one one hundredth of the energy that they use bitching about politics <laughs> and came together and did like one thing, like just one idea, one percent of all of that energy bitching on Facebook or between it's just so it's such an, a massive amount of energy and you just came together and like did the thing that you're annoyed about that either of the other guys doing, you would solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Get together. Like, you know, get, have a, have, the, this is the thing. It's like their, their ideas, right? I'm like, okay, I'm pro Trump and you're pro whoever, you know, I'm Canadian. I don't care. Um, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm the total opposite. You know, it'd be like, you know what, man, like this is it. We both have the same thing. We both want this change. How about we work together to save the mountain, right? Just like mm -hmm. that happened in your community. Let, you know what? I think you're totally wrong and that's cool that you can still have a barbecue at my house. We'll argue this, but we're, we're, much more than just our political views and now let's let's build that same solution that underneath that it's like mcdonald's and burger king in my view of what, what i've looked at pol politics you know some people disagree with that is fine but it's just like if if you realize that both of them you know, are only going to affect minimal change compared to what the community can do then now you're really understanding it and that's why i kind of like trump from a canadian perspective because it pissed people off as like good now get together as a community and do something about it together rather than putting it in the hands of someone else and thinking you can't do anything. Well, I can tell you the resistance is stronger than at any time since at least the Vietnam War. And that's a, that is a very good thing. But I also am somewhat pessimistic. Uh, I, we heard that argument when George W. Bush was president that it would be so bad that it would tip us off the edge. And we heard it with Reagan. And I do not understand the power of, of, Trump's Teflon presidency, uh, that the stuff that should have brought down anybody just seems to roll off his back. So, and, and he has allies um, in powerful positions, such as the Senate president here in the United States, who has been um, one of the least ethical people I've ever seen operating in, in politics, uh, along with his boss. Uh, and, but I, I do feel, you know, even even this administration, as resistant as it is, it has to notice sometimes. When Trump first put out the Muslim ban, I was part of a group of 3,000 people in our tiny little airport in Hartford. And that was a group that was all over Massachusetts and Connecticut came over there to, to say, this is not okay. And eventually they had to take that one back and do a, a slightly more palatable version. And right now we have this thing with the Supreme Court nominee and being accused of sexual harassment of multiple people. And I think his nomination is going to go down because the power of the people is strong enough that even Trump cannot push it through. Uh, so I, I am optimistic about things like that. It's, I mean, there's just so much here, there's, there's such a rich tradition of social change and protest, and people need to read books like Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, and, and um, not just in the U.S., but in other countries, too. You, you have um, achieved in Canada what we in the United States have not been able to achieve in terms of things like um, health care as a right. Um, and all of Europe has had that. But it's interesting, when you started talking about taking a hundredth of the energy, my mind immediately leaps to a completely different direction and a different use of the word energy. And that's, okay, Western Europe, countries like Germany, Denmark, UK, they use approximately half the energy per capita, and now I'm talking about fossil fuels, nuclear, solar, that kind of energy, that we do in the United States. And I would say that they are certainly as civilized as we are, and in many ways more civilized. They have figured out the healthcare piece, they have figured out the free education piece, they've figured out a lot of this stuff that we in the US can't seem to get done. And, you know, so if, if we in the US could 
in our US way, strive to be the best and say, okay, well, if they're using half as much energy as we are, let's go use half as much energy as they are. And that would be a virtuous cycle. And we'd be immediately using 25, well, not immediately, it'll be five to 10 years to make that transition. But we can be using 25% of the energy we now use and think about that, what would that do to the demand for fossil fuels and therefore the extractive industries based on fossil fuels? Think about what it would do to quality of life issues, to how much money people have in their pocket. Again, it goes back to the example I gave of the solar lamps about half an hour ago. It's the same kind of thing. You do more with what you have. You use it more effectively. You get more done. You use fewer resources to do it. Everybody's happy. There's no downside unless you happen to own a... Um, fossil fuel co company <laughs> and even that there's there are going to be need for those uh, those fuels for a while and and even not as fuels but what else can we use that for or what else can we do with that land that is not about mining or, or drilling and i'm sure there's some very very good answers imagine if the oil companies decided that they were going to do this massive forestation project and instead of extracting the oil they were going to just put up enormous numbers of trees, fast growing trees that would sequester carbon and that would provide shade and that would provide on a, you know, a, a regulated scale building materials and on and on and on. I, I somewhere I, I put out a list of like 20 different benefits you get from a tree. I don't remember if it was on my, in my book or on the blog, or, but there, there's a lot of stuff that trees do for us and they do it without getting paid. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, all of those are really good points. And, and what I wanted to ask is because we're touching on like big issues, you know, and they're not, it's not easy solves, you know, there's no quick fix. There's no, you know, it's just like, okay, we'll do this one thing and everything's hunky dory, which would be great if that were possible. So if you could, if you had the power to empower humanity with like an idea or belief or like a system that you would change of the global issues, whether it's poverty, war, peace, and you could just plant an idea or a system or a change that were immediately adopted. Do you have any ideas of, of what you would be like, like a genie empower the human race with to affect the greatest change? I think it would be the idea that these problems are solvable, that we have actually the skills and knowledge to implement solutions. And that's a very big sweeping statement. But you look at things like biomimicry, an industry that didn't exist maybe 15, 20 years ago. Biomimicry is using science to determine how nature solves a problem. And it turns out that nature has solved pretty much every problem we face, solved it eons ago, solved it with very simple inputs, such as like a spider builds a web that is a better designed bridge than humans know how to do. And they do it out of water and dead flies. <laughs> with no waste and so I have a section in Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World called Mother Nature Chief Engineer which spotlights the work of Janine Benyus and the Biomimicry Institute and uh, so the spider web is one example um, there's an anthill that she studied that's out in monsoon country in India where it's either horribly dry or it's flooding so how do you build an anthill that is resilient in these two extremes? Ants figured it out. So now humans can see what the ants did and build buildings that mimic that. Here, uh, right in the next town over from me, Amherst, Massachusetts, there's a company that sells a product called Gekskin. It's a super adhesive that they figured out by studying gecko lizards and how they walk across ceilings. So nature has solved all of these technical challenges and we know enough now to see what nature is doing and to figure out how we might at least somewhat approach that. We may not get the same efficiency. Uh, a green leaf um, is a roughly 90% efficient solar collector. A human built solar collector, most of them are in the like 18, 20, 22% range, really, really cutting edge stuff that costs a huge amount of money and is not in production yet you're looking at like 40, 45%. So we can double that just to get where nature has been already for the last 200,000 years or whatever. <laughs> and in everywhere you look, you see this, and it's very, very exciting. 
uh, she, I think it was in her part of the book where I talk about a kind of concrete that actually sequesters carbon and how much better that is for the environment. If you're going to build with concrete, why not build with that kind of concrete? Yeah. And on and on it goes. It's, it, again, it's, all of this stuff is related. It's all a big web. And we can figure out an amazing amount. We should be able to be food and energy self-sufficient community by community, for example. That, that would be a good goal to have. And again, the, we have the skills and we have, if we have the right mindset, then we can get it done. And meanwhile, the longer we wait, the harder it is. And we should have done this years ago. Um, but the window has not slammed shut yet. So let's do these things while that window is still open. Yes, agreed. 100% agree with all that. Um... And I think that the exploration of uh, biomimicry is really important and it makes sense to model nature, model a system that works already and take the information and then implement it. You know, uh, it's a very exciting and promising um, field of study. Um, I just want to thank you for coming on and and sharing all this stuff and and your work and and what you're doing and and changing that focus to, you know, use your skill set to make a positive impact, social change and, and create meaning in your life that can, that can, you know, affect your community and affect the people out there. Um, before we go, I want to ask you if there's anything that you wish that I would have asked or anything that you want to elaborate on for as long as you want. It's an, it's an open floor, but it's been a, an amazing discussion and, and I appreciate you coming on. Well, the first thing is that I'm here to help. I can help people think about how to do these things, how to incorporate social change in in their businesses, how to go greener and how to do it by going for the low hanging fruit that's going to save the money and make them money. And then once you've done that and and gotten a few years of of savings under your belt, then you can go look at the harder stuff that maybe will cost you something. But let's start with the easy stuff. So I'm very, very good at spotting those. I'm very good at spotting partnership opportunities. I'm very good at spotting new uses for existing products and services or how to retweak them and create something new. And I have a website with a bunch of information on it at goingbeyondsustainability.com. And you can reach me through that website. There is a contact form. You can also reach me by phone. My number in the U.S. in Eastern Time is 413. 486-2388. I welcome your call between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And if it's outside of that, you'll probably go to my voicemail because I actually shut the internet off at night when I go to sleep. And um, uh, so you're you're not likely to wake me up even if you call at 2 in the morning unless it happens to be a night that I left the on for a guest (laughs) but uh, it's better if you call during those hours and I do if I am home in my office I will typically answer my own phone or if my wife gets there first then she will but you do not have to go through layers of secretaries or voicemail or anything like that Um, again I would invite um, people to have a look at this gratitude journal I'm keeping on Facebook Uh, my Twitter is my name S-H-E-L-H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z And it's the most exciting time of my life. I'm 61 years old. I finally know what I want to do when I grow up. And I'm I'm, I'm having a bigger impact. It was a long, slow challenge for me to learn how to think this big. It didn't come naturally. I was much more focused on small and uh, too small, I think, that there is perhaps one regret I do have is that I didn't come to this conclusion earlier and start 30, 40 years ago with this more big systemic thinking that I've been doing now and putting it into practice and learning as I go. I'm a lifelong learner. I, and I think that's very important. I, I started keeping track of how many books I read a year, or I think it was about four years ago. It's been over 80 every year. And that doesn't count the hundreds of articles that I'll read. And um, in, it doesn't count the, the lectures that I listen to, the TED Talks that I watch. I'm always in learning mode. And I find the world is a very exciting place as a result of that. I, I, just, I feel deep passion for what I do, and I feel deep passion for the life I live. I'm, I, I'm very, very blessed in my life. I have a, a wonderful relationship, a wonderful place to live, access to really good food, um, ability to travel. I live in a place where I get to see world-class music and theater, 
not quite whenever I want to, but, but often enough. And I, I just, I'm amazed every day I look out the window and I, I just kind of thank the universe for putting me where I am. Awesome. Well, I, you know, I appreciate all that and I appreciate the work that you're doing um, and the intention. No one's ever given their phone number out. So that's wonderful. That's, <laughs> that's a first. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, I just want to support, you know, your movement and that idea. And I think that that comment about, um, you know, having the idea that it is possible to change the world um, is so huge. It's, is the four minute mile possible or not? And it's the biggest problem in human history. And if there's any a generation to solve it, if there's a, ever a time to solve it, why not now? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and even if it's just you changing your own world in your own life through that own idea, um, it's really beautiful and really empowering. Yeah, I, I actually, that reminded me of a quote from Rabbi Hillel, of all people. I'm not a particularly religious person, but uh, he said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for myself? Who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, um, I forget the next tagline, but it was basically the point where why would anybody care about me? And if not now, when? Amazing. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate all the wisdom you, you've shared. Um, I invite everybody to go check out the, you know, your website and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it's we'll going just- beyond sustainability.com. And it's been really fun to do this. We, we went way beyond many of the questions I typically do in, in a podcast interview. And that's fun. Awesome. Well, yeah, I appreciate you sharing so openly. Um, we'll have to stay in touch in any way I can yeah. support what you're up to. Just let me know. Go Great, the same way. All right. Take care. Thanks everybody right. for watching. Bye. Bye.